Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. We are about to start this uh, session on accelerating education for the SDGs uh, to, to dwell on the on the translation uh, that our colleagues from the SESN China Hub have done of this report. Uh, but we're going to give a couple of minutes to our participants to join. So um, I ask you all to uh, patiently wait just a few minutes until, until we get started. Thank you very much. Recording in progress. Recording in progress. Recording in progress. Recording in progress. Mm -hmm. So I see that several people have have joined in the last minute. So just good good afternoon, good morning, uh, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, we are about to start. We're going to give uh, perhaps two more minutes to participants to join. Um, but we're very excited uh, about the agenda that we have for today's event uh, and hearing also from you and your thoughts about, about this report and, and how you're working on your universities. So I'm going to propose that while we wait for the rest of uh, participants to join, um, that you use the chat function um, that you can see in the bottom of your screen to introduce yourselves uh, and where you're coming from. We're very keen to hear um, what university you're joining from, or if you're a professor, a student, you're part of the administration of the university, if you're member of SDSN's network. Um, so please take advantage of that function to introduce yourself and perhaps also to start um, sharing your thoughts about the report or any activities that you are or your institution is conducting on uh, education for the SDGs. Um, and then in one more minute, we, we will get started. Thank you very much. Wonderful. So I'm going to propose that we get started. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Maria Cortez Puig, and I am the Vice President of Networks at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Um, we're going to be launching the translation to Mandarin of a report that SDSN produced last year. Um, called Accelerating Education for the SDGs in Universities. Um, this was launched last year on September of 2020 uh, during the International Conference of Sustainable Development. And we've seen a massive uptake of this report. It is in fact the most visited resource of um, SDSN, uh, at, at the website of SDSN. And it has now been translated to Spanish, to Mandarin, of course. Um, to Korean, as well as to French and Portuguese. Um, I'm going to get started with our first panel. Um, so I'm going to welcome Tal Kestin, that is the manager 
of our SDSN Australia, New Zealand and Pacific network uh, that is hosted by Monash University. And I'm also going to welcome uh, Yi Zeng, that is the head of the office of the Institute for, uh, for SDGs of Tsinghua University. She's also the network manager of our SDSN China hub. So welcome both of you. Uh, Tal, I believe that you are going to begin by making a short presentation of our report. So please go ahead. That's right. Thank you very much, Maria. So um, hello, everyone, and welcome. And I am really thrilled to be coming to you today from Melbourne in Australia. Um, and I wish to uh, pay my respect to the um, elders past and present and emerging of the lands on which I am joining you from. Um, as one of the team who put together the Accelerating for the SDGs guide, um, I'm so excited to be here at the launch of the Chinese translation. And I really would like to thank everyone who was involved and in particular the Tsinghua um, SDG Institute. What I've been asked to do today is um, to give you a bit of context about the guide, where it came from, what it is about, where we're going next with it. And this is pretty much what I'll be doing um, with a small digression in the middle um, to give an example of the work that my own institute is doing, the Monash Sustainable Development Institute um, in the area of education for the SDGs. So, in 2015, um, the UN launched the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development called Transforming Our World. And at that time, my SDSN network for Australia, New Zealand and Pacific was working a lot on the different roles that um, different sectors have in helping to meet and achieve the SDGs. And while government and business seemed to be getting a lot of attention, it was very obvious to us that universities themselves were very critical in many ways to achieving the SDGs. And um, based on that, we put together a guide called Getting Started with the SDGs in Universities, which we launched in 2017. Um, it was amazing to see the reaction to that guide. It created a lot of conversations within the sector um, including at the conferences, the annual conferences that Maria mentioned on um, the International Conferences on Sustainable Development. And during these discussions, what really emerged was that one of the areas where universities have a huge potential to influence the achievement of the SDGs, but that possibly they're not fulfilling their potential as much as they could, is around ensuring that their students are ready to be helping solve the challenges, sustainable development challenges in whatever um, profession they are choosing in their lives. And that maybe it was useful to share um, good practice from around the world on what that actually looks like. So two years later, after a lot of work, um, we published Accelerating Education for the SDGs um, last year. And really what we tried to do is put together a guide that aims to inspire and empower universities and other um, tertiary and higher education institutions to provide their learners with the knowledge, skills and mindsets to contribute to solving the world's sustainable de development challenges and achieving the sustainable development goals by offering practical approaches and guidance and resources and inspirational case studies. So very briefly in a nutshell, the report includes the why universities need to do education for the SDGs. What does it actually look like in the university? And then a couple of chapters looking at the how universities can do it. How do they actually implement it? The why to me is, is pretty obvious. I hope it is for you, but um, that basically society is facing pretty incredible and urgent challenges um, around climate change, but around a whole lot of other things. And that we really need everyone on board to be helping address these challenges. Universities reach millions, hundreds of millions of people in the capacity of professionals 
uh, helping them develop their professional skills. And the opportunity there is incredible if all these people could be contributing to achieving the SDGs. So really we put very strongly forward the case that universities should be doing this for all of their students. Now, education for the SDGs covers a really broad range of skills, knowledge and mindsets. Uh, a lot of it is based around education for sustainable development, but also around global citizenship and a whole lot of other educational agendas are being slowly incorporated into what it means to do education for the SDGs. And we explain some of that in the guide. Um, and because the SDGs are a very broad agenda, you can actually incorporate them into practically just about any kind of university activity from the curriculum to extracurricular activities to even um, things like signage and campaigns within the university. So it's very versatile. Um, but there are some aspects of it, what makes it really quite unique that are a lot harder to implement. And these are transformative learning approaches that really build important skills around systems thinking, problem solving, dealing with complex situations um, that are not really business as usual in the way universities work. And they include things like interdisciplinarity. Um, they include um, action-based learning and they include working with stakeholders from different sectors. So some aspects of education for the SDGs are actually fairly straightforward for universities to implement. Um, and we recommend that they approach it from a, in a very strategic way. Um, but these transformative learning approaches are actually not easy to do within the way universities currently function. And in chapter four of the guide, we actually put forward the idea that maybe universities need to change the way they do things to actually help speed up um, um, including education for sustainable development in their courses. And I'll actually come back to that in a minute. But first, I wanted to also mention that really one of the exciting things about the guide was um, the collection of case studies. And um, as part of the original guide, we um, collected 50 case studies from around the world showcasing really innovative ways that universities are doing education for the SDGs. Um, and to keep things fresh, we actually did another round of collection this year and added another 75 cases. Um, they, these cases represent over 40 countries and cover really different areas of the university, um, curricular and co-curricular activities, how universities are engaging with communities, and also what universities are doing inside the university to try and um, feed action on education for the SDGs, things like training, um, you know, building capacity for lecturers, creating communities of practice, all kinds of things. They're all stored on a, a website hosted by the Technical University of Madrid. And really, I thoroughly encourage you to check it out. Now, going back to chapter four um, of the guide, which was really putting forward that universities, the way they're currently structured, is not really going to respond to the urgent need for change um, and that in, like the changing incrementally is just not going to be fast enough and that things need to potentially change in the way universities do things. And one approach that we proposed in the chapter was around something called the second operating system, which is creating a space within the university that is able to actually function in a somewhat different way, in a more agile way, in a way that breaks silos, um, where it's easier to create partnerships and focus on real world challenges. And so I actually wanted to give you as an example, my own institute, the Monash Sustainable Development Institute, which in many ways functions like this. And because of that, it actually allows it to do very interesting things around education. So 
my institute, I don't know if anyone has heard about it, um, but the, its mission is really to do research, education and engagement um, that works to understand, influence and transform systems for sustainable development in Australia and our region. And we collaborate with partners, build knowledge and capacity and drive practical change. Um, we were established about 10 years ago. We sit outside the faculty structure in the university, but we work with all the faculties and a lot of external stakeholders. And I think we have about 200 staff now. So it's quite a big institute with a long history. Um, we currently are focusing on six domains of change with actually leadership for the SDGs being one of them, but there's a whole lot of other areas. But what I think is really unique about the Institute is the principles that it's bases its work on. Um, being mission-based, so we choose work to do that is about addressing real, real world needs, about everything we do is in partnerships and collaborations, both internally within the university and with external stakeholders. We value different ways of knowing, um, so it's not academics always know better, but we value the input of the, the professions that we work with. Um, we experiment a lot, we test different ways of creating initiatives, of implementing them, and we learn from those, and we are taking a systems transformation, so it's looking at the whole system that we're hoping to change, not, not just one aspect of it. What this has meant for education is that we've been able to implement some really interesting and unusual kinds of um, educational activities, specialising in interdisciplinarity, multi-stakeholder, impact focus programs that are done in collaboration with other parts of the university and with a lot of external stakeholders. Um, they include things like um, leading a leadership for sustainable development master stream as part of a, a cross-faculty master's on environment and sustainability, um, a leadership program that's already 20 years old but has been refreshed around the SDGs called Green Steps. Um, we've just implemented a new institute that is training politicians to make better decisions for the complex world that we're facing today. We have programs around social entrepreneurship, um, a PhD program that is actually focused on the SDGs. And we work with other faculties to help them develop their own curricula that are focused on sustainability and change. And the reason I think that we are able to do these kinds of things is the fact that we function in a somewhat different way to a traditional university faculty or school. So this aspect around transformations actually resonated with a lot of people after the guide was published. And um, really the guide was meant to be a springboard for ongoing conversations. And we realized pretty quickly that this concept of transformation was where we felt there was need to have a lot more discussion. Our university is really capable to respond to the urgent need for sustainable development transformation in society, or do they need to change to um, be better able to do that? So um, a couple of months ago at the conference, the ICSD conference in 2021, um, we launched a new working group um, to actually think about this issue and provide, um, I guess, try and collect best practices and disseminate them, as well as create a conversation about the role of universities and how we can help them focus more on the SDGs. We kicked it off with a really amazing discussion with some university leaders, and I've included the YouTube link there, and I thoroughly recommend that you um, check it out. Um, and this is an area that we have kind of just launched and we're getting going. So please watch this space. So you can download the original guide and the new guide, the new Chinese 
version and all the other versions from the SDSN website. Um, and I hope you do that and check it out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tal. Um, we're moving now to uh, Yi Zeng. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Maria, for having me as the panelist here. And thank you, uh, Tal, for it's, it's really a thorough um, introduction to the report. Um, now I'd like to share my screen and uh, it should be right in a minute. Um, so um, since Ta has already uh, presented the report thoroughly, so I will love very much um, just run to the topics. And it was uh, very much of a joy and informative process of learning when doing the translation last year. Um, so I do have a few highlights and uh, takeaways for, for uh, our colleagues and um, uh, our audience today. Uh, so in this report, it actually brings up a new concept of uh, uh, the ESDG education for the SDGs. So previously, uh, UNESCO has announced the concept of ESD and ESD for 2015 to 2020 and ESD for, uh, for 2030. And six days ago, UNESCO has also published a new report in the Reimagining Our Future Together, which uh, put the, uh, our vision to the uh, 2015. So this report actually brings up a new idea of ESDGs. That's actually, uh, if we do have time, we can come back to this. How does a uh, task team uh, come up the idea of framing these new ideas. Um, actually, as long as um, I was doing the translation, I could feel the uh, ESDG concept actually reminding us uh, that this new concept actually in indicates that integrating the SDGs into universities is not only a matter of uh, teaching and researching, and also, um, but it, it actually intertwined with a university's management and its social impact. Um, so now it comes to the difference uh, while I was doing the translations. Um, so for the left side, we have, I, I do put the Chinese uh, version of the graphic here for our audience, but, uh, 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 on our right side is the uh, five main role for universities in China defined by the MOE here. So the reason I'm mentioning this here is now pointing out how different uh, these uh, two interpretations are. Um, on the contrary, my point here is even though it seems different, yet these are strong similarities and moreover, there are um, lots of overlaps among different roles, no matter which inter interpretations. For example, we have the living labs, uh, which is widely used in Europe and introduced in this report as well. The concept may be relatively new to my colleagues in China, but however, lots of experiment, experiments we did actually with the same uh, approach here in China, not only just not only under the name of living labs. Uh, for those who's not familiar with this concept, the living lab is actually an integrated approach to uh, teaching and re researching that allows students to design, practice, and test uh, and share the new solutions on campus. So one example here I found. Uh, in, in Tsinghua universities is during COVID-19 pandemic, students in Tsinghua has designed the automated access control device for taxing uh, human temperatures, which could actually minimum the, the human contact. So um, the living lab approach is not only developed 
student uh, the ability to solve real world problems, which is uh, the same scenario uh, as the SDGs, but also contribute to the tran transition from um, the uh, daily uh, learning to the real uh, lifetime research, which could solve the problems. Um, and also from my point of view, the best way for universities to integrate the SDGs um, is not uh, a, a separate different roles, of, different role of universities um, or separate different targets to different schools or sectors. It's actually better to uh, remain the overlaps and see them as the opportunities uh, to call for cross sectors or interdisciplinary cooperation, um, eventually trigger the systematical change within the universities. And here um, it's actually leads to the third takeaway is the UPM case. Um, actually, I got the learning from the Times Higher Education Summit as well. Uh, so, uh, one senior university leader said that the um, traditional structure of universities divided into subject-led faculties or departments can sometimes deter researchers from working more collabor collaboratively on SDG-related topics. Um, nowadays, universities are embracing the SDG-related research and led to the creation of thousands of academic uh, collaborations, including uh, new local and international networks of scholars, but also in sometimes unexpected new institutional structures, such as cross-department working groups within universities. Um, so the case presented here in, the, in this report, which I found very enlightening, is uh, it has pointed out the two-way blockages inside the in internal behavior of the universities. So um, they, the UPM have uh, worked, worked out and created the ITD UPM as a second operating systems to restore those organizational system by addressing complex, complex problems um, of sustainable development and co-creating practical solutions involving agents from all sphere. Um, so as, as Ta just mentioned, there's a, a pool of uh, case study websites. Uh, there are lots of uh, case studies. Uh, you can find the uh, website in the end of our, our report. And there are also lots of resources and tools at the end of this report as well. It, it would be much of the um, useful to, to our colleagues. Uh, as for Institute for SDG of Tsinghua University is where I'm working uh, with nowadays. Uh, we do have uh, four main roles, uh, which is talent training. We have uh, SDG dual mastery programs in cooperate with University of Geneva and um, as MPI program with uh, SDG uh, focuses. And also we have the uh, ex executive training programs uh, focused on the SDG as well. Uh, we do have uh, serving as the research center and think tank at the same time. And with the SDSN network, we are working as uh, on the international network and cooperation at the same time. Um, so th these are a few uh, areas we are working on and starting from last year and released in earlier than in this year, uh, we have done the Tsinghua SDG report. This report is actually uh, combined 36 indicators uh, resulted from the Times Higher Education impact rankings and uh, around 60 cases in Tsinghua University. Um, my feeling is uh, with, with doing this work is actually a uh, a process of educating the educators. So our colleagues have been empowered during this process. And now they know there are, um, there are so many ways, so many things that they could do in their daily work and life that can, actually can help with the SDGs. 
Um, I, I do hope this, this report could bring more perspectives and cases to my colleagues in China um, so that we educators and practitioners could actually contribute to the implementation of the SDGs, more importantly and particularly in terms of shaping the main sites of our future generations. Uh, please feel free to follow us on our social media platforms or reach out to us or uh, myself via email. Thank you so much for joining this session and back to you, Maria. Thank you very much, uh, Yi, for this phenomenal presentation, but then also, uh, of course, for um, doing the translation of this important report. Uh, the network of the SDSN China Hub is active and, and, and really resourceful. And we've heard how Tsinghua University is really pioneering some of these uh, transformations. And I encourage everyone to read the Tsinghua SDG report. Um, so let's move to the next part of this event. We have uh, uh, Dr. Xue Lan, uh, Dean of the Schwarzman College and co-director of the Institute for SDGs of Tsinghua University, as well as Professor Sachs, uh, President of SDSN and Director of the Sustainable Development uh, Center at the Earth Institute of Columbia University. Welcome both of you. Thank you very much for joining us. Amira, I'm going to ask to start pinning uh, Yi so that we can see Professor Sachs and, and Dr. Shulan. And then, um, this this uh, next session of uh, of the event is uh, scheduled as a as a dialogue between the two of you, and I want to throw a couple of questions uh, at you to see what you think about the role of universities in ensuring the achievement of the SDGs, and also how can uh, universities from China and the U.S. collaborate on this very important mission. So over, over to you. Jeff, uh, it's so wonderful to see you. Um, maybe you can start. <laughs> great, great uh, to see you and uh, wonderful to be together. Uh, greetings to uh, all friends at uh, Tsinghua University and uh, across uh, the region. And uh, thanks to Maria for uh, all the leadership. Uh, Yi, you made a wonderful presentation, so we're very pleased and excited. Uh, and uh, Lan, it's it's great to speak together. Uh, actually, uh, after two, I think, rather positive developments. Uh, first, uh, yeah. that uh, China and the United States uh, agreed uh, during the COP26 summit yeah. to more cooperation and uh, especially on, on the climate agenda. Uh, and I think that this is a, a very positive development. And of course, it gave a lot of hope to everybody at COP26. Uh, and then uh, we're just hours after the summit meeting between President Xi and President Biden, uh, which at least on the uh, initial readout was a, a very good, constructive, long discussion uh, with uh, a lot of uh, our known colleagues uh, involved uh, that um, talked about the importance of uh, good collaboration in a number of areas, including, uh, again, uh, the climate agenda uh, and uh, sustainable development. So uh, I think uh, this gives us a, a basis for uh, even uh, more not only more optimism, but more uh, room and action uh, for uh, cooperation and, and collaboration. So uh, let me ask you uh, your, your uh, sense of the current situation. Uh, China also is uh, in the midst of many reforms right now, uh, many uh, new commitments uh, on sustainable development, on decarbonization, on biodiversity conservation, Maybe you could uh, uh, start with a little bit of your sense of uh, where we stand now after COP26 and after this important uh, bilateral summit. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I, I, I fully agree with you that uh, uh, we are quite positive to see the, you know, the readout of the, the, the summit between uh, President Xi and, and uh, President Biden. 
uh, I think was uh, it's really a wonderful uh, thing after you know quite many years of this uh, kind of a uh, attention. And uh, I think uh, we we are we've already seen some hopeful sign at, at what you just said. I mean that you know sort of the uh, you know the the, the joint uh, uh, declaration between U.S. and China on on the climate. Uh, I think that um, uh, you know China. I think uh, you know has in a way. I think in terms of really implementing SDGs, uh, China has been very um, uh, you know consistent. In, in, in its efforts in trying to um, implement the SDGs. And so I think it's some recent development I just wanted to highlight two. One is uh, uh, poverty uh, alleviation. I think, uh, you know, since, uh, you know, 2000, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 12, I think uh, since uh, President Xi uh, came to the office and so he actually took this uh, poverty alleviation alleviation as a major policy priority. And so there was some, a, through a consistent uh, sort of really uh, uh, effort uh, of the uh, entire country uh, over the last, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, eight, nine years. And, uh, you know, so last year, I, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think actually a, literally this year, uh, you know, July 1st, uh, that uh, President Xi announced that uh, China has achieved its goal to uh, eliminate, you know, sort of the uh, poverty. Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, 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 you know, after many years efforts. So I think that's sort of, you know, a, 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 a major achievement, uh, you know, in, 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 in implementing SDGs. The second is in the process, as you just mentioned, is the, that um, last September, uh, when uh, uh, actually the September the twenty September the twenty two uh, uh, you know of uh, of last year uh, that President Xi announced uh, China's uh, uh, you know uh, 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 goal to achieve carbon neutral by the year uh, before the year uh, twenty sixty and also to uh, uh, you know reach the peak uh, of twenty uh, uh, by twenty thirty uh, twenty thirty uh, I think those two uh, you know, those uh, uh, announcements has already been translated into major actions in China. And so in the, in the, in the you know, in just a, a bit over a year, I think there are already, I think, uh, many efforts within China uh, in, in, in pushing uh, on this uh, in terms of uh, renewable uh, energy development, uh, in terms really uh, um, many industrial uh, process, you know, trying to, uh, you know, uh, update uh, their technology and trying to uh, eliminate the old uh, uh, coal-based, uh, 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 you know, technologies and so on. So there's indeed a whole uh, country's effort in uh, moving, um, uh, you know, in, in trying to reach this goal. So I think that um, indeed we see some uh, tremendous uh, efforts uh, of the entire country. In, in, in trying to achieve. Now in China, it's been so-called the uh, double carbon uh, goals. So I think that, uh, uh, you know, a, a, it's sort of the new new trend with what we see. Could you describe, uh, we've heard a, a, a lot recently about uh, President Xi's call for common prosperity, which to me sounds a lot like uh, sustainable development also very consistent yeah, with sustainable development. Uh, what what does uh, what does that mean uh, in in China's uh, policy context right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that uh, one of the things that uh, what people have seen, China has indeed achieved a tremendous economic success over the last forty years of the reform and the openness. Uh, but behind this success, there's also uh, uh, quite some sort of uh, uh, inequality in, in, in a way, in terms of the you know income and consumption. I think that uh, uh, there are different uh, numbers, but but still, uh, I, according to you know uh, to various numbers, at least more than half of the Chinese population is still you know at relatively sort of low income uh, uh, stage. So I think that that's where I think that so in a way, in a way that the prosperity 
that we see that China has achieved has not been uh, the benefits has not been equally shared, and uh, and and that's sort of where I think that the uh, government has felt that you know now it's time to think about how actually we can bring you know uh, the whole uh, population uh, to enjoy a more uh, you know uh, uh, equitable uh, you know benefits of the the economic benefit China has uh, uh, achieved. Uh, so, so that's sort of the, the in a way, the, the goal of eliminating the sort of absolute poverty, but also I think now it's getting how we can bring more people to the so-called mid-income group. So that's sort of, you know, the, the, the next goal. It's, it's very interesting, uh, actually. Of course, the United States has had a period of significant uh, uh, increase of inequality also during the last 40 years. We think about this as uh, you know somewhat uh, two different processes, but actually uh, it's, it's rather similar timing. Uh, I usually say uh, you know President Reagan came to power in 1981 uh, and uh, went for growth uh, uh, and so forth, um, and we've had 40 years of uh, much wider inequality, which we're trying to grapple with now not easily. Uh, China's reforms uh, started also, or the, the current phase started roughly 40 years ago also. Uh, Deng Xiaoping famously said, uh, getting rich is glorious, uh, and China got very uh, rich uh, during the period. But as you say, like in the United States, uh, widening inequalities, it, we know that uh, SDG number 10 uh, calls for reducing inequalities within and among countries. So it's uh, actually very much on the same time scale, uh, yeah. same kind of phenomena, and yeah. uh, probably would be very useful to do yeah. some joint research together to understand because uh, th there are a lot of similarities in, in the timing, the underlying yeah. technology factors, and so forth. Absolutely. I, I think that uh, one of the things that I, I think uh, what uh, uh, you know you just talked, I, I think that's sort of fascinating to see the comparison. I think that um, uh, some people are, are now concerned about you know what's the approach uh, to achieve this you know to to sort of try to re reduce this kind of a, uh, inequality, try to you know increase this uh, common prosperity. Uh, I think that uh, some people may are somewhat concerned whether the government whether to, will to use some kind of administrative sort of measures to to achieve this uh, but that actually that's you know the, the various policy document has made that clear that that's not true but the China certainly uh, wants to make sure that indeed the incentive for economic growth is still you know I think the market-based system is still and uh, there I think that's sort of where I think the economies uh, is based on. But at the same time, they also the uh, how to provide sort of better opportunities for people, you know, in terms of education, in terms of the healthcare, in terms of job opportunities, job training, and so on. So that's where I think a lot of the efforts probably will be made. And also, I think we also have to say that China's tax system is still is still, you know, not uh, 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 quite, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, complete. It's still, uh, there's some, you know, quite some tax reform that's probably needed. Uh, as a, you know, as, as a policy analyst, I think uh, we know tax is a very useful policy tool. So how to use that tool more effectively, so that's another uh, approach that, uh, uh, you know, the, the government is now, now thinking about. But ultimately, I think it's, it's it's really how do we, you know, bring more, uh, you know, sort of, uh, 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 you know, wealth, you know, to to be shared, rather than to cut once, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, you know the, uh, you know the cut once reach, you know, the, the wealth to give it to the others. That's really that's uh, not the case, but indeed, but how to, uh, um, particularly how to bring, you know, the whole gen whole population. Uh, you know, to share the, you know, the benefits. Um, certainly, you know, it, it, you know, there's a lot of challenges. I think a, a different kind of challenge than sort of in, 
uh, compared to the U.S. And and so I think China has a lot to to learn from the U.S. experience. Uh, you know. Uh, well, so to, it, 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 maybe you know, maybe uh, learn, uh, learning from each other, I think, right? Yeah. So the, Maybe some plus, some minus. We're, we're uh, uh, we we are releasing the SDG index for the U.S. states uh, this afternoon in the United States. Uh -huh. There's a huge, huge divergence in the U.S. of how different parts of the country are performing, which is very interesting. And there, I also think the geographical differences. Uh, both China and the U.S. are vast countries yeah. with huge geographical differences of uh, structure, population, and so on. We find in the United States, uh, the Northeast is more or less on the path of sustainable development. New England, uh, uh, New York, New Jersey, uh, not perfectly, but more or less, uh, whereas a lot of the U.S. South and West has mm -hmm. much higher inequality, more poverty, uh, and so we're really highlighting these geographic differences. So this is another area, actually, I think where study could could make a difference, uh, especially with with vast countries. And I think also bringing in uh, in our university network, bringing in the European universities on this question is very interesting because probably of all the regions of the world, uh, I I would think that Northern Europe has uh, best balanced the prosperity and the low inequality uh, mm. and has been able to create uh, really effective systems of uh, healthcare, education, uh, and other social consumption, I would say, uh, that uh, ensures universal access and keeps the inequality down, but keeps the prosperity quite high. So very interesting lessons there too. Absolutely. Yeah, I think actually, uh, I, you know, the, the, since we're talking on this topic, I think also how it's related to, uh, you know, sort of to, to the climate uh, change and so on. Uh, a few days ago, I was having a, uh, a, a discussion with uh, one of our international students who, you know, also is watching, uh, you know, the COP26 very closely. And, um, and he was sort of, sort of making an argument about you know uh, about how to uh, balance, you know the the you know reducing carbon uh, emission versus uh, economic development, and and so his argument is saying that now I think uh, um, uh, given that uh, you know uh, you know the developed countries have have already you know uh, developed so enough and and now China is joining uh, that uh, uh, group and, and uh, but still. There are many developing countries are still uh, uh, on the uh, you know sort of the the path to growth, and so they will I think as, as they become uh, more developed and they will certainly consume consume more energy, and so at the moment uh, the coal is their only reliable uh, uh, you know and cheap uh, sources of uh, um, uh, energy. So, uh, so basically, uh, the argument is that uh, now um, you are trying to phase out the coal, and but but I think that uh, that will certainly uh, sacrifice the benefits of uh, some developing countries, you know, welfare. Um, so, so my guess is, you know, to what degree that we can, you know, help to. You know, I, I think our, through our research, through our effort, how can we actually say that uh, indeed the world is making a, 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 a real effort in also helping developing countries to, to address this problem? I know that the, the, the you know, the, the commitment by the developed countries to uh, support, to help the developing countries, that uh, issue has not been fully resolved at the COP26, right? Absolutely not, not at all. And uh, yeah, no, I, I think one of the, again, one of the areas where uh, we uh, can and I think should work together is that China and the U.S. are co-chairing the sustainable finance uh, part of the G20. Uh, okay. But there aren't answers yet uh, because uh, we need solutions for sustainable finance that uh, haven't yet been found. Uh, I actually put on the table or uh, posted yesterday uh, one thought about how we could 
uh, have some uh, actual levies on CO2 emissions used to finance the energy transformation in the developing countries as one idea. But I think this needs study. Uh, and uh, that's what we're here for, the universities, <laughs> actually to study these things. And since there is this umbrella of U.S.-China uh, uh, cooperation, I think uh, U.S.-China uh, University common study uh, of mm. these issues uh, would, would be, uh, be re really advisable. Uh, yeah. I also see an opportunity for that kind of cooperation in the yeah. Africa context, uh, yeah. because uh, first, a number of things. To my mind, China provides the best roadmap and role model for Africa for how to escape from poverty, because China went from you know, something like 80% poverty to zero uh, mm -hmm. in 40 years, uh, which is uh, should be Africa's aspiration. Uh, mm -hmm. And so China really provides a, a lot of uh, important knowledge that I think uh, it needs to be understood and developed in the African context, how to take good lessons and how uh, direct partnership in uh, particular projects and programs can work. But if it's done uh, collaboratively with the United States and Europe, it, it actually, of course, really enhances that possibility as well. And it addresses the, the challenge uh, of energy that you're talking about. In fact, in Africa, one fact is that for the poorest countries, there's very little electrification to begin with. So it's actually starting from scratch in a way. And so the opportunity to do it in a green way from, from the start uh, is, is very important. China's the low cost producer of uh, highly efficient photovoltaics uh, and so on. So that seems to me to be another great area for uh, really uh, for doing this analysis. Absolutely. I, I think that uh, uh, one thing that, you know, relates to this uh, report on education and, and uh, uh, you know, on, on uh, you know, sort of uh, education for SDGs, I, I, I thought that your comments at the very beginning and for, forward, I think, was really fascinating about the the need for interdisciplinary work. And I think that, um, uh, you know, I, I think you also talked about your experience in running the Earth Institute. I think that's a, a fascinating experience that, uh, that, that maybe you want to share with us a little bit. Because I think that in a way, um, university, uh, the, the, the gene of university, uh, partly it's, it's so disciplined. So the whole, institution is built on you know various disciplines so for so many years people have talked about interdisciplinary uh, you know how to you know in terms of education in terms of research but it's so hard particularly at you know the you know the well-established university it's always so difficult so um, maybe you want to share with with us a bit more your experience in running the Earth Institute how? Earth Institute has been able to do that in, at Columbia. How do you bring different disciplines together? Well, I'll, I'll, uh, it's it's really a, a fun and fascinating question. I've, I've had a lot of uh, fun with it for 30 years in uh, trying to run institutes at Harvard and at Columbia along mm -hmm. those lines. There's one uh, basic point, and then there's one, a couple very operational points. But the basic point is, if you are a chairman of a normal university department, say economics, our field, uh, you say, okay, I want the best economist who's gonna publish in the best economics journals. And so it's a very disciplinary focus, a very uh, a focus based on the metrics of the profession or the discipline. But if you do it differently and say, I want a faculty to address climate change, Hmm. suddenly everything's different because you say, oh my God, that's a complicated issue. What do I need? Well, I need some climatologists. I need some energy engineers. I better have some economists that are specialists in this. I need some uh, behavioral psychologists to understand social psychology. I need some political scientists. 
suddenly when you start from the perspective of the problem, the mm -hmm. interdisciplinarity is not just a theory, it's a necessity because you can't even take one step forward without mm -hmm. all of these experts. And then because they're working on a common problem, for example, this complex problem, how to decarbonize before mm -hmm. 2060, very complicated. You need that range of engineers, mm -hmm. economists, finance specialists, political scientists, sociologists. You really need them together in order to be able to do that. So that's the, the big picture for me is that if you're aiming for disciplinary excellence, universities are organized for that. If you're aiming for broad, complex problem solving, then we need not our departments, but we need these uh, broad initiatives. So a practical question, how do you finance it and how, how do you hire people for it? Uh, and that has been uh, the, the challenge for 30 years in, in my own uh, experience. On the financing, one needs creativity and new sources of financing, but recognizing that since universities are there to serve humanity through knowledge, and since these are crucial problems, there actually does develop more and more financing to try to answer these complicated challenges. So that becomes a practical daily issue, but not a, a fundamental obstacle. And then is the question of how to hire and recruit and by what standards and so on. One thing that I'm happy about is that the notion of sustainable development is becoming a discipline. There are PhDs in it, there are master's degrees in it, there are journals. And so in this sense, it becomes more natural that there are now metrics and standards for hiring and reputation and, and, uh, and, and ability to uh, put new faculty in place. But there still is a, a tension and I think a creative problem solving that each university needs to have. At the Earth Institute, we had everybody with two appointments, one at the Earth Institute and one in a base uh, faculty. So they were both within their discipline and in the interdisciplinary setting. Now mm -hmm. Columbia is actually uh, introducing a new climate school. So it's just going to be hiring for climate change studies. I hope that's right. Uh, you know, I, I liked the Earth Institute model but it had hiring problems. Now Columbia is trying to uh, introduce a, another variant of this. But I would say three main points, Lon, just to conclude, which is focus on the problem and then interdisciplinarity is necessary. Second, solve the practical problems of paying staff and, and uh, running programs. And third, most of us have a core discipline and an interdisciplinary uh, commitment, both. And so finding a way to have two homes uh, for scholars uh, and students, I think, is a useful approach. That's, that's absolutely, I think, uh, wonderful. I think that's certainly, I think, very, very uh, critical, I think, for many of us, you know, in this field. and. Uh, and you are, I, I think your experience are, are, are so essential for all of us to, to try to, to learn from. Uh, before I, I, I see Maria up there and before I, we end, uh, let me just bring, a, bring up another issue related to this one. I think that that's what actually, I think uh, many universities, I think Tsinghua included, I think it's uh, in terms of research-based uh, institutions, you know, I think that indeed our problem you know, uh, 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 driven. For example, I think Tsinghua also recently started a uh, research institute uh, uh, on, 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 on carbon. And uh, I think, you know, you know, there's also climate related research institutions. So that's relatively, I think, in now, uh, you know, common. I think the challenge is how do you organize your training, your, your degrees along those problem, uh, you know, a, a problem based rather than a discipline based. I think um, still university degree tend to be more disciplinary uh, based. So how do we combine the two? That's I think, uh, you know, it's another uh, challenge. For example, I think uh, 
uh, I remember that a few years ago, I was on, I was on a Tsinghua University committee, and uh, we're talking about how to bring you know other uh, you know so knowledge to the to the to a particular engineering program, and the engineering professors was very resistant. Uh, they were saying that they have the body of knowledge they really have to pass on to students before the student can graduate. So there's only so much time you have. So so how do you do that? Well, it, just to say, we jumped at Columbia uh, straight to a PhD in sustainable development in 2005. Uh -huh. It's been hugely successful uh, in that uh, we've had brilliant students and they have gotten brilliant jobs afterwards, which is the test mm -hmm. of the marketplace. And Absolutely. the the way I summarized the, the program, Lon, was to say, you have to satisfy two advisors, one mm -hmm. in the social sciences and one in the hard or engineering sciences. If you can do that, that's sustainable development. So it was a very operational, <laughs> operational uh, kind of perspective. But I, I know we're at the end of our time. I, at first, I just want to thank you, Lan, for all your leadership and Tsinghua. What a great university and what a beacon for the whole world. And I look forward to, in the coming months and years to raising even more uh, our work together. And yeah. I think in all of the interdisciplinary, we also need interregional. We're a globally interconnected world. We depend on each other for yeah. global well-being. And so mm -hmm. I think in all of the uh, geopolitical processes and challenges on climate, on the pandemic, on inequality and all the rest, there's so much we can do together. And I'm, I'm glad our governments are speaking uh, fruitfully and cooperatively together. It gives us even more space for the kind of cooperation we so much uh, uh, cherish and uh, look forward to. Thank you so much. I think I fully, I think, agree. And I, I'm sure that uh, we have more opportunities and more uh, issues to work on together. One, and, wonderful. Uh, yes. Thank you. Very, very excited to do it. And uh, Maria, cool. thanks so much uh, for bringing us together. Thanks for the yeah, launch today. Lon, great, great to see you. Great to see you. Thank you both very much for such a rich and inspirational talk. And I echo uh, Professor Sachs. Uh, it words, uh, Dr. Shulan, you are such a leader in the network of SDSN. Your your thoughts and, and insights are always uh, most welcome. Thank you, everyone that joined us today. And you have the link to the report uh, now translated to Mandarin. Thanks once again to our SDSN China Hub. Um, see you all. And we will be posting the link to this recording uh, for everyone else to see. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. Bye.